of the things. Hey, uh, is there a problem with the sound? Can you all hear me properly? Yes, ma'am. It's clear. And how is it the time? Okay. It's properly audible, right? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. Now I can hear you also. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Um, welcome uh, to all of you to the uh, last and the final part for this basic skills in English, uh, basic skills, uh, writing skills in English. Right. Uh, we've covered a whole lot of thing in the past three days, and uh, um, it's a little tough to do these things in uh, four days. Uh, four days is like a nothing of a time for discussing writing. But I've tried to put together a few things which I think were essentials and basics uh, to somebody who can, uh, who wants to write better, right? Of course, uh, this can be a whole course by itself. Uh, I'm aware of that part, but uh, uh, there could have been some problem uh, with the uh, detailing and the execution by itself, but uh, that is not something that I can help with with the limited time that we had with us. Uh, <coughs> I hope to do some justice to this uh, in the coming uh, time. Let's see what can be done about it. But I think as of now, uh, something you might have learned, okay, may not be the case that you hadn't received anything of the class. Uh, whatever you have had, I'm, uh, I hope you would uh, put it to good use. Uh, so for today's session, uh, we are going to be looking at uh, one of the main aspects uh, of writing, right? And that is editing and proofreading. Uh, editing and proofreading, again, like I told you about uh, writing, can be uh, a whole different area by itself. Like we can talk for at least 10 hours on what editing and what proofreading could mean for us, right? Or how it can be done in a detailed fashion. Um, but in today's class, we're only going to be looking at what consists of basic editing and proofreading. Okay? Uh, so I just want to state that at the outset, uh, you can read more about it. You can. Uh, look up for courses which do that. Uh, in our class, we'll limit it to what basic stuff do you do with editing and proofreading. Okay. Uh, let me share the screen with you now so that we can discuss a little bit about uh, these things and then uh, get ahead with our uh, activity and tasks for today. Please confirm with me if you're able to see the screen. Is it visible to you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, it is your Sure. Thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, this would be what we'll be discussing today. And let's uh, straight get into what we want to do. Uh, a few things about what uh, editing and proofreading would mean in uh, writing. Right. So, uh, generally, the tendency is to use uh, editing and proofreading as uh, equally uh, replaceable terms. But that's not the case. Uh, you can, I think a little bit of more details is available, uh, would be available in your uh, lecture videos and writing. So uh, following that would help you uh, to understand a little bit more. Okay? Uh, I'm not going, it's a lecture by itself there, so I don't have the time to put all of them together. So I'll just be giving a gist of what that lecture would also mean. But for more details, you can look at that. So uh, first thing first, editing and proofreading, they're not one and the same. Okay? They're two different aspects uh, of writing. Editing mostly is concerned with the content aspect of the writing, right? So it's going to check on whether your content is appropriate. Uh, have you answered the questions that you are required to uh, in your writer? What your purpose was, what your intention was, and have all of them been achieved, right? So the questions would include what was the topic? Has the topic question been answered? Have the supporting details been provided? Do the supporting details actually support the claim made in the topic sentence? Uh, has the paragraph got its uh, concluding sentence? Are they unified? They, are they coherent? Right. All of this part, which is mostly related to the content of your writing, is what editing is concerned with. Editing will look for uh, word choices. It will see if you have used good and relevant phrases. Have you included um, irrelevant, cliched, ornate expressions? Right? The ones that we were discussing yesterday. Uh, is your um, uh, sentences up to the mark? Right. Uh, by by which I mean, have you used appropriate style of uh, sentences? Have you used a um, <clears throat> long one or a short one? And if 
the ones that you've used are appropriate for your audience and your context. I mean, the context, okay, which includes all your audience purposes. Right? So these are some of the basic questions that uh, editing is concerned with, which means editing also requires, uh, or while you're editing your work, uh, most essentially it requires you to sometimes rewrite, right? So you work on the draft of your writer and you edit your draft, right? Um, in writing, <clears throat> normally the ones that you see as published documents uh, um, in uh, the websites, on the websites, or as books, or as journals, etc. These are actually the seventh or the eighth revised copy, at least the fifth or the sixth uh, copy, revised copy of what has been originally written. Right. So what happens? Uh, you could ask yourself, what has happened in all these fifth and sixth and uh, seventh and eighth revisions? Revisions basically means editing. Okay. So you write a draft, you have a draft, you uh, rework on that, you revise it, uh, that is, you edit it, and then you have your final. Okay. Uh, editing involves all these processes. You refine your writing, you refine your content and its presentation to the reader so that uh, uh, the readability quotient of your writing improves. So editing is concerned with all this aspect. The most important aspect that editing deals with is the content presentation. Okay. Whether the content is appropriately written using uh, all of those uh, tenets that we have discussed in the last three classes and whether its presentation is up to the mark depending on the uh, and the uh, purpose that you're targeting, right? So that part is there. Proofreading, on the other hand, uh, is more concerned with the surface level uh, revision of errors in writing, right? What includes surface level revision? Uh, that includes mostly spellings, punctuation, and the grammar. Okay, editing is more concerned with the logical aspects. How have you put things together? coherence and unity and everything else, <clears throat> the structure uh, of what you've written. But proofreading, on the other hand, it's more concerned with the superficial aspects, these surface level aspects like spellings, grammar, punctuation, etc. Right? Uh, what also becomes a part of proofreading are your modern day uh, formats, alignment, font, font size, font style, headers, footers, index, all of these things, the format as such of any document or a report also becomes a part of the proofreading aspect. So while you're correcting your work or editing, uh, you're revising your work form format, you're basically or essentially proofreading, right? Uh, <clears throat> you might have heard about people called copy editors, right? Copy editors do both. They edit for uh, the content. They also do the proofreading aspects. Proofreaders don't do the editing. Right? These are two different jobs. Proofreaders are not expected to do editing of the content. They're just required to correct the uh, surface level errors with respect to punctuation and grammar and spelling, uh, etc. Right. So this is essentially the difference between editing and proofreading. Keep in mind that they're not one and the same. OK, now uh, some of the basic things about editing and proofreading. The first thing, uh, this is again concerned with editing. Write simple sentences with one subject and the predicate. So the best way to um, start off with writing, or uh, even if you're a seasoned writer, you're somebody who's very good at writing and all that, it's always better that you write simple sentences, right? Uh, simple sentences, uh, just the meaning of simple sentences is one subject, one predicate. Okay? You're not uh, adding too many clauses. You're not adding too many uh, other segments to your sentences. You're simply keeping uh, you're keeping your sentences simple by using a subject and its um, um, <clears throat> adjacent predicate. Right. So uh, very simple method of uh, looking at your work. So if you have a work written, if you're beginning to edit the work, the first thing you should see is, uh, do my sentences look simple enough? And by simple, what we mean is it is accessible to the reader. It is not difficult for the reader to process and understand what you've written. Right. That is one thing. But does that mean that you can't write long sentences? No. <clears throat> we discussed this also, right? Uh, long sentences uh, are definitely allowed in writing, maybe not as much in the formal writing, but you see them abundantly in all forms of writing. Okay. What do we mean by uh, <clears throat> don't include long sentences, right? Is the following. In writing, when long sentences become bad, they usually become bad because they are breathless, roundabout, pleonastic, redundant, less emphatic, cluttered, and ambiguous. If the long sentence you've written has any one of these problems, okay, whether 
you you have to check if the long sentence you've written is a breathless one it's a roundabout one it's a pleonastic one redundant less emphatic cluttered ambiguous we'll look at uh, what each of this mean in a moment but if your sentences has any of these problems then that long sentence is not good it has to be worked upon okay whereas you will see plenty of examples of long and unwinding sentences especially in narrative and descriptive fictional writing it is essential to that writing right we discussed about experiential writing sometimes you have to add a lot of details give a lot of nuances so that your reader stays with you uh, understands what you are saying and also builds that experience uh, that you are talking about along with you that's a, that's that's how a successful author works on it right uh, this kind of writing is uh, very common in descriptive narrative um, type of writing okay, which is common in fiction right uh, <clears throat> but your long sentences become bad if they have one of these things listed here okay we look at them uh, what each of them mean another thing now this is connected to proofreading so the first uh, three things that's been mentioned here is related to the editing aspect of your uh, writing the next you have to be careful end punctuations in sentences okay you need to use them properly the most commonly used uh, end punctuations include capital letters comma period and a question mark okay these are the basic punctuation ones and they're sometimes also referred to as end punctuation except for maybe comma right all of them are essential very very important okay so if not the other punctuations like colon and semicolon and so forth these basic punctuation um, errors need to be corrected before you send off anything for a publication or a documentation okay so that's about punctuation this is a part of proofreading right next sentence fragments you must keep away from sentence fragments if you are writing uh, in a professional domain you're writing in a formal setting right however this rule is uh, exempted for people who are creative writers okay because they are allowed to play around with the language as they want uh, can you give me examples of fragments or at least tell me the places where fragments are possible what are fragments <clears throat> fragments are uh, uh, incomplete sentences okay fragments uh, would either come without a, a subject or it would come without a predicate right so say look at an example right because it will Okay, because it rained is not a full sentence. This is an example of a fragment. Hmm? Can you uh, tell me uh, a few places where fragments become okay? Of course, in formal writing uh, or uh, <clears throat> professional writing, it is not allowed. You don't do that. Technical writing or research writing will not allow you to do this kind of thing. Uh, but there are places where it is okay. Can you tell me what it would be? Anybody? Any idea where uh, fragments can be okay? No idea? Don't you watch uh, ads on social media and uh, TV and all that? Do ads use full sentences? Am I still audible to you guys or are you uh, off the call? You are audible, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, you can occasionally respond to things, you know. Uh, I don't want to make this a monologue. So, yes, ma'am. Yeah. At least yes or no can be expected. No, I'm not asking you to present a thesis, but if when I ask you, haven't you seen ads? The least you can say is yes or no. So the fragments, uh, fragment like instructions are seen very uh, commonly in the, uh, advertisements, you know, billboards, right? Uh, they all use fragments uh, to present a point. Right? They don't use full sentences because full sentences, there are high chances that it blows up ahead of the people. Uh, so keeping just giving in a catchphrase uh, is how they do it. Uh, look at the titles of uh, articles in newspapers right they don't write full sentences they also use short catchphrases to put in there right uh, that is uh, you uh, don't have enough space right you know in newspaper you need to use a lot of uh, there are there's 
uh, there's a lot of content. And these days, uh, instead of contents, you just have ads also. Right? There are four or five pages of just ads. So whatever the limited space they have with them, they have to put in all the news into that. So there's no space restriction in there. Hence, uh, the titles are always shot into uh, fragments. Uh, also, because these titles are larger in their font uh, size than the rest of the article. So it anyway takes up a, a whole lot of space. So they adjust all these things using um, <clears throat> um, cutting down on the uh, entire length of the sentence. Right? Uh, that is another space where you can find fragments. Uh, next would be uh, cartoons. Right? If you are someone who reads cartoons, right? Whether in a newspaper or uh, other full-fledged cartoon works that people do, uh, even cartoons have a tendency to use short phrases, right? The fragments, because again, the point is just to uh, convey the main part of people, and full-length sentences are not something that is expected. Also, cartoon is a pictorial representation, so a lot of things um, are communicated through the visual effects and not just. Um, the words, right? So the usage of words are very limited when it comes to that, right? So these are a few places where you can find examples of fragments. Uh, the last part of it is on uh, run-on sentences. What are run-on sentences? Uh, fragments are about missing predicates or subjects in a sentence, right? What are run-on sentences? Run-on sentences are when you don't use proper connectors or conjunctions to join two different sentences, right? For example, um, I am going to the market. I will go to the college. Okay, two different independent sentences. If you are speaking them together, they need to be connected in some sense to each other. So you have to use uh, some kind of conjunction, right? Or or and or that or whatever you use, right? When they are written together without a full stop uh, or any kind of other, uh, you know, connector related punctuation mark, just like that, you call it a run-on sentence. Okay, get my point? So when you're writing it down, you're writing, I'm going to the college, no full stop, no punctuation, no conjunction in between uh, this. And the next sentence, again, I'm going to the college, right? So when this is written without any proper conjunction or without any um, a punctuation that can show the connection between two, okay, this is called a run-on sentence, okay? So with respect to writing, this is what it means. Huh? When you're speaking, of course, that's possible. When you write things down, you need to show proper connection either using a punctuation mark or uh, a proper connector or a conjunction. All right, that's what the example of run on uh, sentence, the meaning of run on sentences. And fragments are the ones either without a subject or a predicate. Okay, is that understood? Anything that you want to ask? Somebody in the com army commands. Ah, uh, fragments, yes, correct. That's also an example. Commands also, a lot of them uh, use uh, fragments as an example. Okay, any questions? Anything that you have not understood, we are going to look at examples of what uh, roundabout and diagnostic and everything means. But uh, these things we just discussed. Any questions that you have from this part? No, ma'am. Okay. All right. Okay. Now I'm going to give you two examples of uh, long sentences that are appealing and. Uh, no price for guessing both are from literature, great literature. The first one is from uh, Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. 123 word long sentence. Okay. Just have a look at it. Okay, just one sentence, 123 word long. Now, this is a very long sentence, of course, right? There are uh, longer sentences than this, okay? Uh, sentences that are 300, 400 word long. Uh, it is, uh, I haven't seen the 
sentence myself, but um, uh, it is believed that uh, this uh, with the name of the guy. Um, once it, who wrote a four thousand word uh, long sentence, I think it is. Uh, So again, like a um, you know work of fiction, of course, only they are the ones who will be using it. Uh, uh, okay, in English that is okay. So okay, yeah, there's this um, uh, American author called uh, William Faulkner, right? He in his uh, novel Absalom, Absalom has written. A sentence that is 1287 word long okay but uh, it can be contested by uh, you know writers in say so languages like sanskrit or greek uh, particularly also because uh, these are languages which do not have punctuations right so if the uh, language is in such a way that which does not use uh, too many punctuations then uh, it is possible that you know this claim can be negated, but as far as English is concerned, apparently this is the one that is used. But I'm sure I'm missing out on something. I've read somewhere about a 4,000 word long construction. I just don't remember the name of this person. Uh, <clears throat> okay, anyway. Uh, so the point here is uh, in fiction and uh, uh, you know, creative work, uh, this kind of lengthy construction are allowed and it uh, helps adding to the beauty of. Um, the work, but in the formal settings and in fictional settings, this is not something that uh, is really uh, allowed for, or this is not really something that is looked forward to. Because long sentences, of course, have their own problems. They can add uh, detail, but at the same time, they can also uh, result in ambiguities and confusions. Because you know, people don't tend to. Uh, remember so many things in professional settings, particularly it's a problematic thing because uh, people work on a limited space and time scenario there. So no space or no time, simply no time to keep reading uh, those big things, big uh, long sentences that you construct. Okay, that's it. Uh, now the next part here, uh, one more example. This is uh, Saul Bellow's The Adventures of Our March, 810 words. Okay, so see the first example that we saw uh, of Tolstoy, this was more like a narrative paragraph, you know, there's a narration involved in this, right? Uh, so the point that we have made in this, right, the uh, second point, long and unwinding sentences sometimes add to the beauty of writing, especially in narrative and descriptive fiction and writing. This is a, the first one is an example of the narrative, um, descriptive, sorry, narrative writing, which uses long sentences to build on the appeal. The second one that you read uh, of Sol Velo's uh, The Adventures of Our March, uh, Augie March, you can uh, see that this particular paragraph is more descriptive in nature. Yes. So both of these kinds of writing, uh, descriptive and narrative style, uses long sentences to add to um, the appeal, right? Especially fictional writing. Okay. Now we're going to look at uh, examples of what. Uh, we meant by breathless link and so on and so forth. So these are cases of uh, long sentences becoming bad, okay, producing bad effects. When does a long sentence become bad? This is important for us to know. Uh, there are examples. The first one uh, in all the cases are examples of the respective problems cited, and the second uh, sentence is the corrected version of the first one. Okay. 
please see the first one. We observe from the report that though the average number of bookings per day is small, the bookings are maximum because other airlines charge a fee for cabin baggage, which is not a policy in this airlines. And then read the second one. The report shows that this airline has the maximum bookings, though the average number of bookings per day is small. This is because unlike other airlines, they do not charge a fee for cabin baggage. What difference do you spot in both of them? Are they different to begin with? What's your observation? The first sentence of first para is relatively small to the second one because of coma there. First, uh, what first sentence of? First para. There is no paragraph. This is just a sentence. Both of them are sentences. They are both the same. Uh, they're talking about the same things, but there's a difference in the way they are presented. I'm asking you what difference do you spot in both of them? They look like paragraphs because of the, uh, you know, uh, PowerPoint format. They're not paragraphs. This is they're just sentences. What difference do you spot in the first and the second one? What is the striking difference, if not anything? Do you at least see that uh, the second one uses two different sentences and not one long sentence? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, right. And what yeah. have you done with it? You have just uh, split open the first sentence because it was the, the reason being this, that it is breathless, right? Too many things are packed together and uh, there are high chances that you're losing out on what is being exactly said. So. There's basically a cause and an effect relation discussed here. But they have split the cause and the effect into two things, right? Two different sentences, right? That is how you deal with a breathless sentence, right? Uh, instead of cramming things together, or if doing so is affecting the um, understanding or the readability of what you're writing, then you simply uh, cut them down into simple sentences so that it is more accessible to your reader. The second one is definitely more accessible and uh, uh, easier to understand and grapple with than the first one, OK? If you're able to see it, you're able to see it. If not, you must speak, OK? All right, the second one is an example of a roundabout sentence, right? So, yeah, so the point here is that if you write a breathless sentence, then your uh, sentence is incredibly long and without any uh, good effect, right? Whereas if you uh, write simple short sentences instead of the breathless ones, it's much better uh, in terms of improving the uh, readability quotient and the comprehension quotient. Okay, second example, roundabout sentence. Read the example. The following description is intended only to highlight the details that is not mentioned elsewhere. Can be simply written as, this description highlights details not mentioned elsewhere. You've cut down on a lot of irrelevant cluttered phrases from there, right? So instead of going round and round on what you want to say, the following description is intended only to highlight. Don't need all these things. Simply say this description highlights details not mentioned elsewhere. Okay. So if you write a long sentence in the way it is written here in the first sentence, then your long sentences are bad. Uh, with respect to their length, because it is not adding to anything. It is simply occupying space okay, without uh, giving any effective um, impact, right? Now, pleonasm. What pleonasm means? Read the example. It is essential that there be no construction of houses in the area designated as the forest reserve. Okay, Again, an example of long sentence, which has pleonastic features. What is it? It is essential that. Okay, you are adding uh, what you call as cleft constructions in English. Okay, it is essential that this is called a cleft construction, and you don't need this. Okay, in fact, there and uh, it are both cleft constructions. 
but the second one is a proper one because it is cutting out on all the relevant things that's there in the first one right both it is uh, construction and there should constructions are cleft like constructions in english and they're usually used when you want to stress upon a certain aspect emphasize on a certain aspect in this case no construction of houses right uh, but in why is the second one better than the first one because it simply cuts down on the length of the sentence uh, not by compromising on the uh, information that is supposed to provide it gives full information but in few words right it, it helps you uh, the second one is something that has um that has been cleaned of wordiness remember wordiness from yesterday's class we talked about it what is wordiness anybody remembers what was wordiness when do you say that a sentence is wordy or a writing is wordy when you end up writing 10 words when you are only uh, when you could work or when you could do with only five right five was enough but you ended up using them that's what is called wordiness okay next redundant sentences read the example my basic fundamentals of economics are not good basic fundamentals is an example of redundancy in writing why if basic and fundamentals mean the same you either say my basics of economics are not good or you say my fundamentals of economics are not good. You don't have to say basic fundamentals. They essentially mean the same thing, right? All the students must assemble together in the playground for taking the oath. Assembly itself is coming together. So you don't have to say assemble together. Again, redundancy. Okay? Redundancy is making your sentence unnecessarily long. You simply write all the students must assemble in the playground for taking the oath. Okay? Next is emphasis. So remember, less emphatic. If your long sentence is less emphatic, then that's also a problem. Uh, look at the first example. A few of our members heard you at a talk in San Francisco and applauded you for your dynamic personality when they returned. Okay. How do you rewrite it in order to build on the emphasis factor? The second one. A few of our members heard you at a talk in San Francisco and when they returned, applauded you for your dynamic personality. Right, that adds more emphasis to the statement than the first one. Right, so if you write the first one, then uh, it's bad because it's a long sentence without adding emphasis. The second one is fine because there is emphasis added using the when they returned in the right place. Ambiguity she noticed a huge dent on the door that was right in the center. Okay, what is the ambiguity here? A huge dent on the door that was right in the center right we're actually talking about a dent in the center of the door but making it unnecessarily long using a that clause is somewhere creating a confusion to us the sentence could have been easily written as uh, written as she noticed a huge dent in the center of the door right that is good enough and that is clear enough it uh, adds more clarity to what you want to write than writing on the door that was right in the center okay so the problem here is the pe people who read it could be confused whether the door was in the center or the dent was in the center, right? So this kind of confusions can happen if you use uh, constructions of this fashion. Instead, you can go for a simple construction like the second sentence. You notice a huge dent in the center of the door, right? Okay, so that's on this one. Any, any questions as of now? So all this aspect that we discuss, ambiguity, emphasis, redundancy, Dynastic uh, constructions, roundabout sentences, breathless sentences, they are all connected to uh, bad effects produced by long sentences. When they are used properly, long sentences can be good. They have their own um, you know, uh, benefits and advantages. However, if this is how you construct your sentences, then it's going to be a problematic thing in writing. Okay? So when you're editing your work, uh, uh, whatever you've written down, you have to check for your sentences for all these problems too. Okay? This also then becomes a part of your editing. Any questions? Have you understood these uh, examples of bad long sentences? Yes, ma'am. Yeah? Okay. All right. Any, any questions that you have? Okay. No, ma'am. Like no. okay. What's the difference between pleonism and roundabout? 
what is the difference between pleonasm and roundabout? Okay. Uh, what is pleonastic constructions? See. You read the sentence and see if you can find out the difference. Both are concerned. OK, you did not read the next one. Okay, read this. Okay, so both are concerned with what? Both are concerned with uh, uh, the loss of uh, clarity due to usage of additional words. But roundabout is when you are adding um, unnecessary adjectives and modifiers to your uh, sentences, which are not uh, really giving you any meaning, right? That is roundabout way of saying something means what? You could hold uh, it straight, but you're then going round and round with things, right? Pleonastic is just a constructional form. Okay, It's more related to the structure of the sentence than the number of words used itself. Okay, So there is no uh, difference in the first and the second sentence except for the fact that you've used there and it is essential, which is why I told you uh, this construction, it is uh, and uh, there should these both basically it and there right both of them are uh, used in cleft constructions in english right but the problem with uh, it is essential is that it is uh, it is a kind of construction which is uh, suitable only when you have a uh, proper subject in question like if you know it's a, the subject is a um, say a person or a place or something then it is uh, mostly a person if you are referring to this as a person then uh, it works better in that cases. But when you're describing an event or something, it is better to go for the their cleft construction because that builds on more clarity. Okay? Uh, basic difference between pleonasm and roundabout is in pleonasm, the focus is more on the, um, the structure it and there. But the other one is more about uh, presentation of your uh, uh, ideas with a lesser number of words uh, and with more clarity. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Understood. Uh, yeah. Any more questions like this? That was a good question. Actually, a lot of people can get confused about what is exactly the difference between roundabout and pleonasm. In fact, you can ask this question about anything uh, that's on the list. You could say, what is the difference between roundabout and roundabout? Right? There are very subtle differences between all of them. And uh, you understand them uh, better when you look at uh, the examples. Right? So yes. Uh, just keep this in mind that all of them are concerned or the major problem highlighted in all of these uh, uh, issues that we discussed is the usage of uh, more number of words or wordiness is what is discussed in all of these. Okay? But in different kind of wordiness, that's what we do. Okay, all right. Uh, we move on to the last part here. Let's look at uh, the proofreading aspects now. Uh, common uh, errors in... Uh, the uh, proofreading, commonly cited errors in proofreading. So we're first going to look at some punctuation errors. Uh, missing comma after the introductory phrases. Okay. So uh, read the example. According to the weather report, heavy rains are expected beginning this week. So that comma that you see after report is very, very essential. This is called an introductory comma. Uh, all introductory phrases is required to have a comma following it. Okay. So for example, say, uh, look at another uh, sentence like um, you can write the sentence in two ways you can say delhi is very hot in summers during summers okay you can also write during summers delhi is very hot okay so if the second way is how you're writing it then during summers become an introductory phrase to delhi is very hot right 
so that means during summers uh, will be followed by what a comma right so similarly any sentence that you write with an introductory phrase like this will uh, have to be followed up with a comma so this is the first error that you find very commonly found error in writing english second one is missing comma in a compound sentence okay look at this we are uh, aware of using uh, coordinating conjunctions when you form a compound sentence right you know what is a compound sentence right yes no yes yes yes, yes right compound sentences are uh, a sentence that is uh, that includes two independent clauses right uh, joined together using a punctuation um, or uh, a conjunction right either a coordinating um, no no not either the coordinating conjunctions like and or but so uh, therefore so on and so forth right so look at the example so we know about the coordinating conjunctions that you require in a compound sentence but what a lot of us miss out is that the conjunction that you use whether it is and or but anything needs to be preceded by a comma so this is a writing convention uh, with respect to punctuation rules in english that uh, all these coordinating conjunctions need to be uh, preceded with a comma so i was quite scared comma and i looked around to see if i was all in. okay that's the right way of writing these down third one comma slices of few sentences um, i am skilled at example i am skilled at swimming comma i do butterfly strokes okay uh, with just the comma between two independent sentences this can be considered as an example of run on sentence because there is no proper connection established if at all you are planning to establish a connection then comma is not the one that you are going to use you have to either uh, use a semicolon right to show a connection and a continuation of the idea or you have to put in a period mark that's a full stop to separate out these two separate sentences right additionally what you can also do is add a coordinating conjunction after your comma in order to make it um the correct uh, in order to follow the correct convention in writing okay so three options available in this case either you uh, add a semicolon or you add a full stop and separate the two sentences out or you add a coordinating conjunction after the comma so that the writing convention is followed Okay, all the three methods are acceptable, but not simply putting in a comma between two independent sentences. Okay. Fourth one, missing or misplaced possessive uh, apostrophes. Okay, the first case, Asha's, without that apostrophe, Asha's office desk looks really neat. This is a case of missing apostrophe, right? Asha's office desk, it needs to uh, show what? Possession, right? Asha's office desk. So to show possession, uh, a common punctuation mark that's used as an apostrophe, right? So the first one uh, is a case of a missing apostrophe. Uh, the second one is a case of, uh, second sentence is an example of a misplaced apostrophe. Officers should report to the center on time. Here, the S in the officer is not uh, a reference to possession. It is a plural mark, right? Officers in plural. So this is a case of misplaced apostrophe. You don't need an apostrophe there because it's a plural mark. So apostrophe before an S is only uh, quality of uh, proper nouns or pronouns to show possession, okay? to show a possessive marker, but not with plural markers. Okay, you might know it, but then these are very commonly found mistakes in uh, this reading. Missing commas in a series, another one. This this comma has a very special name. This is sometimes called a serial comma or also an Oxford comma. Uh, what does it talk about? When you have a list of more than two items, okay? Uh, every item in the list must be separated from the other with a comma. This is the rule. Okay? When you have a list of things which uh, exceeds two in number, every item in the list has to be separated with a comma. It's called a serial comma. Uh, look at the example. You have pencils, color pens, and writing pads, right? Three things in the list. So each of them, by the rule, needs to be separated with a comma, even though you have a conjunction following it. Okay. So the right way of writing the sentence would be pencils, comma, color pens, comma, and writing pads were distributed among the children. Okay. 
this is applicable only when you have a list of things. Okay, serial comma, keep in mind, they are only applicable when you have a list of things to talk about. Okay, a list of qualities. Things by things, I mean, list of uh, things, objects, places, qualities, uh, whatever your uh, noun is. If there's a list of those things, then you have to use a serial comma. Okay. Uh, all right. Some errors related to grammar. The first error would be of agreement. So the subject and the verb needs to agree with the agree with each other, right? Subject is singular, verb needs to be singular. Subject is plural, the verb has to be plural. You have gone through these things in your lectures and not going in detail. Pronoun and antecedent. What is an antecedent? Antecedent is that which the pronoun refers to. Okay. So in two separate sentences, there must be agreement between the antecedent uh, of the pronoun and the pronoun. Okay. So say, uh, look at an example like this. Uh, Gita has uh, gone to uh, the university. She will return by evening. Okay. So what is the pronoun here? Gita has gone to the university. She will return by evening. Pronoun? She. She, right? And uh, is she uh, in agreement with the antecedent Gita? It is, right? It follows the gender correctly. See, in agreement, remember, what is the idea of agreement? What are the markers of agreement in English? Person, number, gender, right? Agreement, these are all agreement markers. The person, the number, and the gender. So when you say person, it's first, second, third person, right? I, B, U, U, he, she, it, they, right? And also the other personal uh, pronouns in its objective forms. Uh, when you say number, it is singular or plural. And when you say gender, it is either feminine or masculine. Okay? In, in the traditional sense, of course, there are more now. And uh, the pronouns have now changed to uh, incorporate the um, the new labels that we have these days. Not getting into those details right now. But uh, generally, there has to be agreement on the person number gender, whether that is between the subject and the verb, or whether that's between the pronoun and the antecedent. In this case, she and Geeta agree with each other in terms of number, in terms of person, and in terms of gender also. OK? So that's the idea of pronoun and antecedent. Antecedent is what the pronoun refers to. Tense consistency. If you have started writing using past tense about something, usually in narrative paragraphs, people uh, suggest for past tense, but present tense narration is also possible. Uh, but whatever you have chosen for the narrative uh, technique, whether it is past tense or present tense, you need to be consistent in its usage. That is, from beginning till end, you need to keep the tense intact. You cannot midway through change from present tense to past tense, unless the context you are defining requires you to talk about something in the past. Otherwise, the overall tense, the overall uh, sense of the time that is generated by your write-up or your article has to be uh, consistent tense-wise, okay, time-wise. So that's about tense consistency. Pronoun consistency, same thing, right? Don't in midway start talking about something, you know, you, you presented something as uh, feminine and then midway through you are changing it to neutral. You have, start, uh, you have started referring to it as it. Then somewhere else you, have, you are referring to something as she. This is not possible. If you have uh, begun on a particular uh, kind of uh, pronoun uh, to use for uh, an antecedent, then you have to maintain its uh, uh, gender and the number and the person. Okay? Midway through, don't change its consistency. Right? That's pronoun. Of course, uh, as suitable for the time that you are uh, that you've chosen to write it, your verb endings should be consistent with the tense that you're chosen. Prepositions. Preposition, we know. Uh, people who have been attending the Learn the Rope sessions, we worked on the grammatical collocations. And one of the things that we discussed there was the collocation between adjectives and prepositions. right? And we know this is a stronger form of collocation. So one needs to ensure that you're using proper uh, prepositions to form these collocations, like interested in or relevant to, right? not relevant for or relevant of and all that. So this kind of errors are also common. This grammatical collocational errors are also common. That needs to be checked. And the last part would be uh, misplaced modifiers or dangling modifiers. What do they mean? So if you have uh, a modifier associated with a particular noun, let us say an adjective or an adjective clause, 
then both the modifier and the modified thing has to appear together. It cannot be separated out from each other. Right? Say, for example, if I say, um, uh, the files uh, must be returned, which belongs to the department. Let me help you by typing this out. I want you to understand this aspect of this. Uh, Files must be turned Just look at your uh, chat for a while. Yeah. Just to demonstrate to you what uh, misplaced or dangling modifier means. Uh, which part of this is a modifier? Are you able to identify that? I know you have not been introduced properly to clauses, but can you try and find out what is a uh, modifier here? This part, okay, which belongs to the department. The last part, the latter part of the sentence that you see here, right? which belongs to the department is an adjectival clause. Okay, uh, it, uh, By adjectival clause, I mean that they act like adjectives. And what are adjectives? They are modifiers. What do adjectives modify? What do they modify? A noun or a pronoun. And what is being modified in the sentence? Which belongs to the department modifies uh, which noun in the sentence? No. Files. Files. The files, right? So the files, which, yeah, correct. Uh, both of you are right. So the files is the noun that's been, uh, the noun phrase that's being modified by the adjectival clause, which belongs to the department. What do we mean by a misplaced or dangling modifier? Is that the files, which needs to be modified by the uh, the modifier, which belongs to the uh, department, are separated out from each other, right? Which is by the name misplaced or dangling, right? Dangling because it's dangling like nothing at the end of the sentence. Ah, correct, Devra. So the right way of writing it was to say the files which belong to the department must be written, right? The modifier and the modified needs to appear together while you write down. They cannot be separated and left to dangle or be misplaced elsewhere in the sentence, right? So that's the idea of misplaced and dangling modifiers. This error is also very common in writing and spelling errors, of course, or uh, you know, uh, English particularly is a difficult thing because there's no other one of the respondents between the spelling and the pronunciation. So it can be uh, a bit extra conscious on this part. These days you have a lot of uh, softwares and uh, apps that can you know that like the spell check and all that. Otherwise, you have the good old dictionary uh, to, to correct those things. Um, Common kind of errors basically are between you know the words that can be used both as noun and word, right? Like advice, advice, practice, practice, all of these. Word choice related errors, we already looked at it in those uh, uh, the, the part on breathless, redundant, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so all of these, right? Undefined words or phrases, irrelevant phrases, vague references, remember sort of stuff like that, things like that. Filler words, you know, uh, uh, no, uh, you, you will see filler words more commonly in speaking, of course, um, because you know you need time to think and all that. But in writing, particularly, it is not allowed. Maybe uh, a good thing or a bad thing. Some people say it's a bad thing. I personally don't think that uh, uh, fillers or uh, um, you know some kind of uh, special words like this is a problem. But uh, the, prob uh, the real problem arises when you're using too many of them, right? So if you have, say, five sentences of some content to speak, if uh, uh, at least uh, one minute or two minutes of your presentation is uh, filled with all these filler words and other uh, random references, then that is a problem. But uh, using them, peppering them here and there once or twice or thrice, or maybe say even five times in the whole of the speech that you made is not a bad thing. Uh, it's not extremely and it's not possible you cannot completely wipe them out of your speech because that's how people naturally speak 
right? Unless you're giving a monologue or you're bi-hearted everything and you're just uh, uh, blabbing it out and uh, blabbering in front of you. So not entirely wrong, but of course, overuse of anything is bad. In writing, particularly, this is a very bad thing to do because you don't have to, right? You have enough time to think through and use the words that you require to explain what you want. So in writing, you won't uh, see anybody, any organization or any publication company that allows for a filler words while you do it, right? So that's one thing. And the last part is jargons and on it expressions. Okay? All of this are something that is related to word choice uh, errors and it's a part of editing, not, uh, I don't know how did this slide end up here, but any anyway, should know that word choice related errors are mostly a part of the editing exercise, not a problem. Proofreading is all these spelling errors. Uh, grammatical errors and these uh, punctuation errors. Okay. We haven't discussed all of them, of course, but these are the most commonly found errors uh, in editing as well as uh, proofreading. Uh, so I think it serves your purpose. Now, uh, one thing I want to do uh, before I ask you to take a look at your own work is the sample exercise on uh, proofreading and Editing right now, we are concentrating more on the proofreading part. Let's see if there are editing exercises. There could be one or two places when you have to do that. Uh, but can we do this editing together? Please look at it and tell me a few things that you can figure out as problematic in this slide, the content in the slide. Let's go line by line. The first line, critics of the 2015 film Star Wars Episode 7. <clears throat> but let's do one thing. Before we take it line by line, just read the whole of it once. Okay, Go through that once. And uh, once it's done, we'll uh, do the editing line by line. <clears throat> Tell me once you're done reading so that I know. No, 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 they have Okay. Uh, critique and critics are two different things. Okay. Critics refer to people who uh, critique the work. And uh, critic is an analysis. Okay. Critics are people and critique is an analysis. They are different. Done reading, everyone? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So let's uh, take this thing one by one. The first sentence, so first line, the seeds of The problem with that? No, right? The picks of the 2015 films are what? So, second one. I've called the film. Source of items, comma, should be there. Force awakens comma. After that. Force awakens half fall after that. The fix of the 2015 film Star Wars. Why do you need a comma there? Uh, just to separate the. You don't have to do a separation between the subject and the predicate using a comma, right? Not required. Look at it. The whole of that first part, no critics of the 2015 film Star Wars episode 7, Force Awakens, is the subject of your sentence. Hold that, that big chunk. And followed by your verb, have called. So we don't have to use a punctuation. Not required. Right. Okay. 
then next one next line uh, okay so is there a problem there no right uh have called the film third one unoriginal and predictable the story so closely Read that one. Third line: and, the sentence can be uh, uh, new. Sentence will begin from the story. Uh, okay, you can either do that or what else can you do? Of course, you can separate it out as two sentences. That's also possible intervention. But what else can you do? Can continue with this comma also. I think. Comma, where? After predictable. I have called the film. Ah, then your sentence is going to run in the problem of comma size of few sentences because they become two different sentences which are, uh, you know, um, incorrectly joined. Right. You can think about using conjunctions. Or semicolon. Semicolon. Have called the film story so close to the uh, Film, yes, you can do that. Yes, that's possible. Or you simply write because, right? Because the story so closely mirrors the very first Star Wars film in 1977. That is possible. Or like you said, semicolon is possible, right? That's also possible in this one. Okay, so two options. How about the next one? Mirrors the very first Star Wars film in Yes, but in fact, it allows the structure that punctuation errors. I can give you a clue. There are punctuation errors. In this. After in fact, there is a comma. But in after, fact. In, uh, after in fact, there is a comma. There's also a comma after but. But, comma. In fact, comma, right? Yes. But comma, in fact, comma. It follows a structure that predates all the next sentence. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This is an important line. Check if you have followed. But in fact, it follows the fifth one. In fact, it follows a structure that predates all films no not figured so of course the comma is a problem and look at this word it here Right. This is also problematic because we are referring to what? We are referring to both of the films. right? So using it there will not work. Okay? Either you have to say they follow because see, we are talking about the Star Wars series and we're talking about two movies there. So uh, the it, the pronoun that you have used is not consistent with uh, its antecedent, which is a plural. Right, so it's that they're not agreeing in number, so we'll have to either change it to they or add a phrase which means similar to both the films. Right, both can be done in the editing part. Did you see that? Can you understand it? Yes, no, understood. Huh? So, when you use they, you know, then what happens to follow? Does it remain follows or does it become follow? Follow follow right but in fact they follow a structure that predate 
again predate will have to be changed to predates will be not changed to predate that predate all hollywood films uh, that of the hero myth okay uh, then what else okay any other problems you have figured in sixth one fifth is okay uh, there are two errors one of punctuation and the other of uh, the pronoun and antecedent inconsistency and the subject verb agreement in follow and predate right uh, in the sixth one there's a punctuation error in the sixth one capitalization what would be in capitals here name of anything has to be in capital right hollywood has to be written I with a uh, capital h that's the problem here rest of the thing is fine seventh one that's because director george lucas based star wars on the again errors of punctuation capital letter george capital and name yes yes name name of the director george lucas g and l need to be uh, in capitals what else need to be in capitals the two names star here star, star wars, wars. Star Wars, right? Star Wars. Both need to take capital S N W. Okay, uh, based Star Wars on the ideas in Joseph Campbell's 1949 book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Yeah. Joseph Campbell. Also. Joseph Campbell again. Okay, same thing. J and C needs to be in capitals. And what else? The hero. D also should be kept. Yeah, the hero, right? So uh, when you're writing down names of uh, titles of movies and uh, books, etc., the main words, all of them, the first word, of course, needs to be in capital, although the is functional. If the has appeared in between the title, then it won't take a capitalization, right? But because it's the first word in the name, it has to take a capital T. Uh, every other word, okay, non-functional words, not by which I uh, mean, uh you know things like prepositions conjunctions articles they will not take capitalization but every other lexical word noun uh, adjective verb adverb all of them they are going to take a uh, mostly the nouns and the adjectives they'll definitely take the capitalization in time so uh, h is going to be capital p is going to be capital f is also going to be capital the hero with a thousand faces okay uh later editions of campbell's book even featured okay anything in the ninth line books books uh campbell's book no no we are talking about uh, star wars written by campbell okay the hero in thousand faces that's what we are referring to later editions of this book that he has written so no need of writing campbell's book that's okay <clears throat> There's something else that's missing there. See if that's there. Okay, that sentence does not have anything. I think it's okay. Later editions of Campbell's book, that line is fine. The 10th one even featured Star Wars hero, Luke Skywalker, in the front cover. In the front cover. Apostrophe is not right now. Star Wars after Star Wars. No, apostrophe Star Wars hero. Hero of Star Wars. So the Star Wars need an apostrophe. The uh, a possessive apostrophe. Star Wars hero Luke Skywalker. Okay. Full stop. Full stop, yes. The last line needs a full stop after cover. Yes, that's right. But the tenth line has a mistake. What is it? This one. Hero Luke Skywalker in the front cover. It's not in, it's on. Okay. 
Later editions of Campbell's book even featured Star Wars hero Luke Skywalker on the front cover. So there's a uh, problem with the preposition used, right? Not in the front cover, on the front cover. Okay. So these uh, was a very simple activity on how you edit uh, your work, right? So uh, if you are somebody who writes uh, uh, very often, then uh, some of these mistakes, especially the ones relating to grammar and uh, spellings and else would be a little lesser. Uh, the problems would be mostly with respect to the arrangement and coherence, etc. But if you're a beginner, then you will see that there will be uh, problematic areas in both the uh, surface levels as well as the uh, uh, art of arrangement. But I have strangely also seen the case that people are excellently coherent when they write, but they end up uh, making a lot of surface level errors. So yeah, you can find all kinds of uh, um, writers. Uh, so good news for all of us is that uh, writing is a skill, and with proper practice and training, you can definitely become a good one. Right. So it's not. Um, uh, something that you get by birth. Nobody gets it. This is something that is uh, anything that's a skill is uh, called a skill because you can acquire it through proper training and uh, you know, uh, exposure to it. So writing is the same thing. So it's not uh, you know a Herculean task to uh, achieve good on writing. If you follow and practice things properly, it is uh, possible and. While you do that, a couple of these things, uh, knowing a couple of these things would certainly uh, accelerate the process of learning also. But of course, practice is the key. Right. OK, uh, any questions? <clears throat> Could you uh, help me with something if I ask you? Uh, you know, you, do you all have the uh, write-ups that you have written? From yesterday's class, so some of some of you would have uh, people who were present for all the four sessions. Um, I would like you to uh, work on that paragraph uh, and edit it, uh, and send me both the first version and the second version of the uh, paragraph. Please mail it to my ID. Is that possible? Um, no, I think, ma'am, I don't have the ID. Yet. No, I'll give you the idea. That's not a problem. But uh, if uh, is it possible for you to send it, please, whatever. Maybe I can do it. Ma'am, I lost my original work. Okay, right again then. Okay, at least for uh, the people who are here, uh, do this exercise again. Uh, and uh, if possible, of course, no compulsion, but it would be nice if you can do the right uh, I have a version of what you have written in the first class. Uh, but I also want to look at how you're going to incorporate these things and, uh, uh, you know, uh, improve on the originally written work. It, you, it is an important activity for you also because you will see how drastically what you've written in your first draft changes. Okay. Uh, if possible, uh, send in both that versions to me. I have shared my mail ID here. Uh, but anything else that you want to ask with respect to... Uh, Ma'am, I have written that yesterday's work on peer data in the software. Do you have that one? I should have it. Uh, I have to check. Yeah, if you can provide that, then I can read it. Uh, if I can, I'll, I'll check if peer data uh, should be saved somewhere. They usually have a system of saving this. Yeah, meanwhile, any, any questions that anyone has about uh, the sessions? Generally, anything that you've seen or it is a general uh, opinion on what you have heard. Have you heard about these things before or is it the first time that you discussed things like this? Some of you were there for all the sessions, so I think it would be nice for you to talk about it. You, uh, 
rarely get a chance to uh, interact, right? You can say anything you want, that's not a problem. Uh, it can be, uh, I mean, everything needs to be popular. It's not a problem. No. <clears throat> okay. Book or other source for improvement. Improvement on what, Devraj? Writing skills. Oh, there are plenty of uh, things available in the market. So. It's possible uh, uh, to read it from anywhere, but um, this is this is more or less what everything we'll talk to you about. Uh, you can read. I think there could be a few things on paragraph writing. I don't have a list of it. I'll try to put in a reference while uh, when this uh, uh, content is uploaded for you. Right? This uh, materials are uploaded for you. So. Uh, there's one, there's one by, uh, forget the name of that person, check, please. But they are a little dense, okay, maybe they, they, they may not be very good for uh, people who are beginning to do these things. Those are actually for people who uh, who are a bit good at it. This, uh, if you're uh, talking about academic writing, then I think it is a good option. Uh, he has a good work on it. But general writing, I think, Forget her name, Alice. Uh, Alice uh, Savage and Tricia Mayer. The effective academic. That is also academic writing, but they have good uh, sections on paragraph writing. What is this person's name? Alice and Patricia. These two authors, I think it's a, a co-edited volume. This one is good. Then, even if it's a good option for it. Both of them talk about academic writing. Um, but uh, go to look at paragraph writing and other aspects. One more which I'm talking to. Essential Guide to Writing, yes, it's by Thomas S. Cain. I think I have seen, but uh, there are loads of it in the market. But again, you know, this is, uh, this is very self-paced. You will have to take some good time of it and understand what we are trying to say. Um, <clears throat> A basic thing, this would work. What are what are we discussing? Start to the intermediate stage or an intermediate stage writing. As much is enough. But if you're looking for advanced writing skills, in then uh, some of these uh, authors can help you. Uh, Aditya, I have like a uh, set of things with me, but I'm not sure what you have. What did you write down? Laptop. Uh, laptop, yes, I have it with me. Now, how do I share this? I'll just copy paste it in the chat. Maybe you can copy it from there. Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You can do that. Sure. Sure. I can copy it from there. Send in a copy. I've already shared my ID. It's in the study. Okay, any other questions? <clears throat> so, okay, thank you so much, uh, all of you, for joining in. It was uh, nice to talk to you and meet with you and uh, uh, tell you about a few things that I have learned about writing uh, myself and with the help of a few of uh, books and authors that I have read. Uh, I hope uh, some of it would be useful for you. 
uh, it's a little bit difficult to do justice to sessions like this uh, because anything on writing is a bit time consuming. So I know that is not enough. Uh, this, like I told in the beginning of the class, is something that can become a course by itself. Uh, every aspect of the is something that can be done for a few more hours and get practice performance. Um, so this kind of substitute and all for that, a lot of things have to be jammed together. Uh, okay, because I want to talk to you about at least the basic, all the essential things on this. Um, I hope it was uh, at least a little bit useful for you. Uh, thank you to all of you who have uh, continued for all the four sessions uh, and the ones who haven't made it, I understand. Make this up. Uh, I did not want to split it and also it sort of breaks the stream, right? Uh, you forget by the time you come for the next session what is discussed. Um, that was the logic behind the um, sequence days. Uh, okay, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, coming in and uh, being consistent throughout the sessions also. Uh, we will turn it. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. See you and uh, have a nice day to all of you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you.